I get a lot of satisfaction out of being here, Pastor. I get satisfaction out of being a farmer out or whatever. I, I, I love that. That's a thrill to, to watch those cows and calves. And I, I just enjoy being part of that. It satisfies me. Uh, but you know what? Work uh, is supposed to be satisfying yes. and rewarding. Whatever we do, it's supposed to be fun. Uh, and I, I always feel really bad for people who tell me that they just hate their job. Or they just, oh, I just hate my life or my job. And, and I think, you know, I, I, that breaks my heart because I've never really had to work a day in my life. Because my work's always been play. I love my work so much that it, it's just play to me. And, and so I feel sorry for people that have to have, you know, just go through life and hate every minute of it. Uh, you know, it's supposed to be fulfilling. But a lot of people just feel tired after they've done their work for a week and they're like Monday morning, oh no, here we go again. So there, the problem is, there's no fulfillment in your life. Now today I'm going to talk about inner satisfaction. I'm going to talk today about how to have peace that comes from the inside. Because we will never have satisfaction from the outside. We're, there's no perfect jobs. Did you know that? There's not one perfect job. And so, and so some of you, uh, you know, you, you put wingdings on widgets as they go down a... You know, a conveyor belt all day long. You're putting wing things on wing. And that's your job. And you think, this is so boring. Why? There's no fulfillment in my job. Well, there can be. Your job can be fulfilling. And you can be happy with whatever you do, wherever you are. But today you need to listen carefully because this sermon I'm going to preach this morning will tell you how to be satisfied. How to bring satisfaction into your life. Because it should be rewarding. Now... As I said earlier, I've never worked a day in my life because I've, I've played every day in my life. Yeah. But the truth, I do remember when I was a kid, uh, we had to work. My granddad had this, my, my, there was something wrong with him. I don't know what it was. <laughs> he thought it was fun to pick up all the rocks off the farm. <laughs> and it wasn't until years later that I figured out he never picked up a rock. <laughs> he drove the tractor. <laughs> and me and my brothers, we picked up the rocks. But we had, so he, we put in a few days of work, but most of the time we just played through our life, enjoyed what we did because it was just so much fun. The truth of it is, we even had fun picking up rocks. Yeah. <clears throat> now, today I'm going to talk with you about that thing of fulfillment, inner satisfaction. We're going to hang this or frame it in a picture of a story today. The story we're going to find in the fourth chapter of John uh, in the New Testament, in the Gospels of John. We're going to start there and we're going to start reading about verse... 27. So if you have a Bible, turn to John 27, and we'll start reading right there. Here's the story. Here's how it says. Now, if you'll remember from last Sunday, uh, Jesus had gone to a town of Sychar. He had gone there, and he had broken a lot of cultural rules. Because, number one, Jewish men do not speak to women in public. They just don't do it. And number two, Jewish people avoided people from Samaria, this particular town. If, if you remember from the story last week, the, the Samaritans were Jews that stayed home when the, other, the rest of the nation was taken into captivity to Babylon. Those Jews stayed in the Palestine area. They intermarried with Gentiles around them. They moved the temple from Jerusalem to Samaria. All right? So they, they really aggravated those Jews who had gone to Babylon. So when they came home from Babylon, they wouldn't have anything to do with the Samaritans. So Jesus went to Samaria and He talked to a woman. So that's where we find our story right now. All right, He's at a well in Samaria breaking cultural customs and His disciples have gone to McDonald's to buy lunch. <laughs> and now they've come back. All right, And here they, here's where we find the story. Verse 27. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked what he want or why are you talking with her. Um, they were they were not surprised. I mean, I think they were surprised that he was talking to a woman. But having been around Jesus for a little while, and by the way, this was they were, were fresh or new to following him. They didn't understand at all what was going on. But so they were confused. Uh, but they were trying to learn not to be judgmental. And I want to say to you today, all of us Christians, that's something we all need to work on, okay? If 
we're not careful, we get too judgmental and we think we're the only ones that got it right and everybody else is wrong. And, and there's, that's just simply not truth. We have the way, the truth, and the life, and that's Jesus. But, uh, but we, we've got to be careful and not be quite so judgmental. Now, the next part of the story, as it goes on, the disciples came back with lunch and Jesus is talking to the woman. Then the woman, I want you to get this now, she leaves her water pot at the well. Now, I'll have to be honest with you. After I finished this sermon, had it completed and ready to present to you, it dawned on me, probably there's another sermon here. And I want to come back someday and preach this sermon about leaving your water pot at the well. Because if you'll think about that a moment, there's a tremendous sermon in leaving your water pot at the well. Why did she leave the water pot at the well when she went back? Because she found something that was a whole lot better than water. She found, she came out looking for H2O water, but she found living water in Jesus. And she left her water pot at the well. That's number one, she found something better. The second point of the sermon I'm going to preach today will say this, she planned to come back for some more. Amen. She was going to come back and talk more with Jesus. And I don't know about you, but I can't, never, I can't get enough of Jesus. Amen. I want to come back and talk to Him every day. I, I'm, I want to leave my water pot right by Him all the time That's right. and come back again and again. So if you have to preach a sermon somewhere, you go ahead and preach that and let me know how it goes and send me a copy of it. Okay? <laughs> now this woman, uh, let me read you the verse in case you thought I was making it up. Verse 28. Then, leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of town and then made their way toward him. Well, just use your imagination for a moment. Here we are, typical small town, Sychar. I don't know how big it was, I don't know how many people were there. Say there was three or four hundred people living in the town. Well, the shops were closed, the markets were empty, uh, the kids were kept playing in the street with their sticks and kicking balls, and they stopped, and everybody went running to the well. Now, the city had one water source, and that was the well of Sychar. It was, had been dug by, by one of the, by the, uh, the patriarchs of the Jewish faith, and so Jacob had drugged that well, and, and so they all went out to Jacob's well and to, to drink the water. Okay, they came out there looking for this man who could be the Messiah. This could be him. And so they were so excited. I mean, if somebody came in and said, Hey, God's in Springfield, Missouri. He's downtown on the square. Folks, we'd all break our neck to get down there with him because we'd want to go see him. Well, that's what they did. They got down there uh, to see him. Now, this woman... She went into the town of Sychar, her hometown, and she told everybody she met, she, just everybody, hey, the Messiah, it could be the Messiah, he's out the well, come on, let's all go. And folks, she went and told everybody that they should come to the well. Have you ever tried to introduce Jesus to somebody? <laughs> have you tried to do that? I don't know, I'm not judging if you have or if you haven't. Uh, some people get kind of nuts about it, and I think it'll drive more people away than, than they bring it to Christ. But I think also we all need to be in the business of bringing people to Jesus. Yes. I think we all need to be telling folks about Jesus and, and doing a better job. But in case I forget to tell you, when you do, make sure you, you tell them with your life as well as your words. Yes. Because sometimes what we do speaks a whole, whole lot louder than what we say. Well, anyway, <clears throat> we're supposed to tell people about Jesus. Did you know that? Mm -hmm. Let me quote you a verse. Go you therefore into all the world and preach the gospel. That's Jesus talking. He said, go you therefore. Now if you interpret that correctly from the Greek language, the way that the sentence is constructed, it, said, it really better translated, as you go through the world, preach, teach, baptize. So the point is, since we're going to be going anyway, let's tell people about Jesus. That's right. since, you go through your, since you go to the office, go tell people about Jesus. Since you're going to go anyway, go tell them. Since you're going to raise a family, go ahead and tell them. Since you're going to be a farmer or a rancher, go ahead and tell your, your feed suppliers and your, your family and people you work with. Since you're going to be going anyway, tell people about Jesus. Alright, that's what that means. <clears throat> now remember when you're trying to tell people about Jesus, you've got to remember what you're not trying to tell them about. You're not trying to sell them on a denomination. Some people say, well, I want you to come to my, my Pentecostal church or my Catholic church or my, you know, you pick out a denomination. We're not trying to get people to be in any denomination. I'm not talking about that. 
We're not, I mean, if you are a denominational person, well, that's fine, good for you. But your denomination won't save you. Your denomination will not get you to heaven. All right? But Jesus will. Your church won't get you to heaven. Even as good as a cowboy church. This won't get you to heaven. But Jesus gets you to heaven. So when you tell people about Jesus, remember, don't try to sell them a church or a denomination because there's a thousand things wrong, wrong with any of those. Amen. But there's not anything wrong with Jesus. I've never met anybody, atheist, agnostic, uh, that, that, wouldn't, well, that wasn't interested in Jesus. He's the most interesting figure in all of history. Even if they don't believe He's God, He's still the most interesting figure. Imagine a whole, a whole religion formed on His life and about Him. And they want to know about Him? Yeah, sure. So tell people about Jesus. Now, back to this, the theme of the message this morning. Now, we're going to try to talk to you about how to have satisfaction. And so when you bring Jesus with you as you're going, and when you tell people about Jesus while you're putting your whatnots on your widgets, going down the... While you, when you tell people about Jesus, you will find the greatest satisfaction that you've ever found. It's, there's something about it. I can't explain it. I just know that you will go home peaceful and at peace when, you, when you've done that. Okay. <clears throat> so if you're not satisfied with your life, you might want to take a, a lesson from that woman at the well and leave your water pot behind as you go through your life planning to come back. Let's read verse 31. Meanwhile, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> his disciple urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, Well, could someone have brought him food? All right, so here we have God talking to this, his friends who had brought him lunch. He'd walked all day from, from, noon till, from early morning till noon. And he hadn't had anything to eat. He was hungry. He sat down here at the well. They went and got food, brought it to him, and he wouldn't eat it. He wasn't interested. He wasn't hungry. Why is that? Because he was satisfied. He was satisfied. He had something had happened that they didn't know about that had brought him more satisfaction than any food they could have eaten. He had just shared hope with a woman who was hopeless. He had just shared forgiveness with a woman who was a sinner. He had just been God and had been able to talk about it. So, what we've noticed here is that his disciples, just like the woman at the well, she started talking about H2O. Jesus was talking about spiritual water. Now they come back and they're talking about food, and Jesus is talking about spiritual food. It's a they're missing communication, all right? But they're they're going to get it one day. So don't be so troubled about material things, and uh, and, and and get. Be more interested in what God has done. So back to the question. Are you satisfied? Is your soul at peace? Are you restful in your heart? In your spirit? Because if you're not, you can be. You can be at ease and at peace. One of the things Jesus taught us as He started to leave, He told His disciples, He said, Peace I leave with you. And then, he, then He qualified it. He said, Now it's not peace like the world gives. It's not peace as an absence of war. It's not, not, not that kind of peace. But it is a peace from the inside out. It is a peace that starts in the very heart and mind and soul of a human being. And I'm saying to you today, do you have that kind of peace? You see the kind of peace I'm talking about? It's there when the doctor just says, you've got a year to live. That peace is not touched. It's not disturbed. It's not bothered. The boss comes and says, sorry, your job is over. Doesn't touch that piece. Because that piece is deeper than that. You see, it's a piece that's down deep. Do you have that kind of piece? And if you don't have it, there's only one place or person in the entire universe that will have that has it to give to you. And his name is Jesus the Christ. He is uh, He is amazing. Now, so what satisfies your soul? First thing I want to say is doing God's will. The, the most satisfactory thing that we can ever do is God's will. Let's read as we notice what Jesus did. He said there in verse 34, My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. The greatest satisfaction Jesus ever found was doing God's work. You said, wait a minute, isn't Jesus God? Well, yeah, He is. And so 
it's a story that's sort of semantic, semantic, but some, we, can't, we can't get it said with words because it's confusing. But Jesus did the will of the Father. I think you understand it if I say it like that. He did God's will. He was God, but He did God's will. Every way perfectly. And that's what gave Him great peace. He said, my food is to do God's will and to finish what He sent me to do. <clears throat> I want to share with you this morning a simple truth, and that is this. You will never find satisfaction. I don't care where you look other than in Jesus. See, when you were born, when you were born, you were born with a hole an emptiness inside of you. An emptiness. And, and all of our life we try to fill that emptiness with things. Uh, sex, money, jobs, family, uh, careers, uh, entertainment. We try to fill that hole in our life. And it just keeps nagging at us. The more we put in it, it, it helps for a little while, but then we walk away. And, uh, you know, we're not satisfied because nothing will ever fill that hole in your life except Jesus Christ. He's the only one that will ever fill it. You'll never be happy in other way. Would you read this with me? Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Because people are always asking me, and you need to know, okay, preacher, how do I find God's will? How, what do, I, how do I know God's will? I want to do it, but how do I know what it is to do? I can't figure it out. I mean, I see God working in other people's lives. I watch them... And they're fulfilled and satisfied. And they're doing God's will. They found it. How do I find God's will? Let's read it. It's right here for us. <clears throat> do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Conform. Get it? Pouring. I always think of that as pouring greenware into a mold or concrete into a mold. Pouring something into it. It, it conforms to the mold. Now the world is wanting to pour you into its mold. The world wants you to look and act and smell and think just like it does. All right? So, it says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. Here it is now. But be transformed. Transformed is the word metamorphosis. Are you familiar with the word metamorphosis? It means to be changed. Don't be, but, but be metamorphosized. Meta, I can't put it in the back past tense. But be transform, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is. See, folks... When you, if you try to find God's will using the pattern of this world, you won't find it. You will find God's will when you're transformed into His image. When you're transformed into what Christ wants you to be. God calls His children, right, to just to minister right where they are. You see, if you, if you're a farmer or a rancher, you minister right where you are. No matter who you are, where you are, you're a minister, a student, uh, uh, a working mother, whatever it is, you are a minister to your people and keep working on that because you can work right where you are because you've been transformed and not conformed. All right, number two. The second thing I want you to notice is you, you can find satisfaction if you start living for the Lord right now, right where you are. So you don't have to wait till you graduate from high school, college, or get that master's degree. You don't have to wait till you uh, have children or get married or retire, or whatever. You don't have to wait to serve the Lord. You can start right now. Let's keep reading. Verse 35. Don't you have a saying, it's still four months until harvest? I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe for harvest. The Jews had an idiomatic saying. They would say things like, if somebody wanted them to do something, say the wife said, I need you to fix this broken thing. The husband said, oh, it's four months till harvest. It's just a way of saying, you know, what's the hurry? Take a break. Chill out. It's four months till harvest. See, so that's how you spoke. It was an idiomatic saying in their, in their country. Jesus said, you, you have a saying, it's four months till harvest. But he said, i tell you the truth, right now is harvest. This, it, it's not going to be four months down the road. It's right now. This is the harvest. This is the time you're here. This is your day. This is your moment. Some people say, well, you know, later on, I'll try. When, you know, when I get this, when I go there, when I become, I'll, well, no, no. This is the day. Right now is the time for you to start loving the Lord, living for Him. <clears throat> Farmers have to estimate the time to harvest their crops. You harvest them too early or too late, you, you miss the quality of them. The time is now. now folks, I don't know, but I, I'm a gardener. I love to grow sweet corn in my garden. 
You like to grow sweet corn? Or I bet some of you like to eat it though, don't you? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, a certain time of the year when you've got sweet corn growing in your garden, when it gets just perfectly ripe, you can even you can't get close to the garden till you start smelling it. It puts out that sugary sweet smell, and it boy it floats all over. And, and, the, and guess what? The raccoons also smell it. <laughs> and all over the country, little raccoons are having committee meetings, and they're saying the corner for the killing source is about uh, let's meet up there tonight. <laughs> Well, so they have timing. They know when to come and eat your corn as well. <clears throat> so you, you have to be, have the timing, at least of a raccoon, okay? I know people who have wanted to be missionaries. And they've, they, they want to go all over the world be a missionary. Tell, I want to go to, to uh, Romania. I want to go to Japan. I want to go to where I tell people about Jesus. Well, folks, there's people all around us that need to know about Jesus right now. Amen. So if the Lord tells you to go, well, then go. But don't wait till you get there. Just start telling. We're supposed to do it right now. We're going to be living for the Lord right where we are. <clears throat> so people say to me, well, I, I see, it seems like that some pe that people know where to go. Like, I know that this person's in the right place because God's using them. This person is in the right place. God's using them. Well, that person, well, we, 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 are in these, we think we're in these right places. And we said, how do I know where my right place is? Can I be honest with you? Tell you. Your right place is this. You go deep into the Lord's will. You, go, you study Him. You love Him. You learn about Him. You get deeper in prayer. And as you get in prayer, God will move you where you need to be. You don't have to worry about where you need to be you need to worry about how it, how you are in relationship with the Lord. That's all that matters. He takes care of the where. Now you take care of the deepness. You go deep in the Lord. And the more you love Him, the more you get, it, it, surrender to His will, the more He will use you. I, I also will often hear young preachers that they will... I've had many of them come to me and say, Brother Scotty, I want you to know I've surrendered to be a preacher. I'll say, no, you haven't. <laughs> No, no, you've not surrendered to... If you've said, if you told the Lord, I'm going to just surrender to be a preacher. Folks, just surrender. Just surrender. If you tell God you're going to surrender to be a preacher, that may mean you ain't going to surrender to be a good husband. Or a good father. Or See, just surrender. That's the main thing. And, and you go deep in the Lord. He'll put you where He wants you to be. You, if you have a calling to preach, you'll find a place to preach. God will open that up. If you've got a calling to be a mother, you'll find a way to do that. If you if you have a calling to be a whatever... You, God will put you there. You just go deep in the Lord. You go deep in Him, and He'll spread you around where you need to be. But remember this: the only thing the devil does, the best trick the devil has, is that he'll just tell you, "Yeah, that's all right. Do all that stuff. Just don't do it today. Just wait till tomorrow." See, waiting is an absolute deal breaker. All right. <clears throat> I'm, on, I'm about done, so stay with me. So don't worry. If you're doing the right ministry, don't worry about it. Well, preacher, if I was in the right place, listen carefully. Let, well, let read verse 36 with me. Even now, the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus saying, one sows, another reaps is true. I sent you to reap what you've not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you've reaped the benefits of their labor. What's Jesus saying there? He's saying, okay, the one that sows. And the one that reaps, it's all the same. It's all the same. If you are a good reaper, well, reap. If you're a good sower, so. But here's the thing. Go through the work. Just go through your life. Loving the Lord. Living for the Lord. Sowing seeds once in a while. Reaping once in a while. It doesn't matter. If God calls you just to sow a few seeds, well, then sow some seeds with your life, with your words. Tell people about Jesus. Sow seeds. Then, then you one day down the road, you'll reap somebody else's harvest. They'll reap your harvest. It don't matter. We're all on the same team. Just go through the world. Love Jesus. Tell people about Him. And if you're there at the harvest, fine. If you're not, fine. All right. <clears throat> Whatever you find to do with your hands, do it. Okay, let's, let me close. <clears throat> Here's what I want you to do. Now, let's read. And I'm, I'm done. Verse 39. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in Him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said, but now we've heard for ourselves. 
And we know that this man really is the Savior of the world. When you ask Jesus to stay with you, He will. You ready? They said, please don't go. Stay with us. And He stayed with them for two days. Now when He comes into your life, He stays forever. Are you with me? But the point is, when you ask Him, He will stay. And then the last thing I want to say is, the Word of God creates faith in people. Now listen to me carefully. This is important. Even though it's the last thing I'm going to say, I want you to hear it. The Word of God creates faith in the people around us. When you are living God's Word, or when you're telling God's Word, you create faith in the people around you. It's a domino effect. One touches another, one touches another, one touches another. So when you're living for the Lord, you are preaching. Go ye therefore into the whole world, preach the gospel. That's what you're doing when you live for the Lord. Sowing seeds, reaping, doesn't matter. Just go. And the Word of God creates its own faith. Let's pray together.